Hi, my name is Tom Anglin. I'm, I'm pastor of the Bridge Church in Spruce Pine, North Carolina. For the last few days, I've just had an impression that hasn't gone away that I need to put my testimony on video. And so um, I want to just share with you for a few minutes uh, what actually happened in my life, coming to Jesus and then turning from Jesus and coming back to Jesus. I guess I'm a modern day prodigal son. But uh, in 1965, I was six years old living in Titusville, Florida because of my dad's occupation. He was working where they would launch rockets uh, and he was working on what was called the VAB building is why we were there. And we were in many different places as in my growing up, uh, but uh, we, we were there for a season and we were going to a church. I was raised in a very devout Christian home and, one Sunday morning in this church in Titusville, Florida, I realized that all the adults were just focused on what this preacher was saying. And for the first time in my life, I listened in. I thought, well, it must be important. So I began to listen. I couldn't tell you anything that he said during the course of his message. But one thing I can tell you, the power of the Holy Spirit was upon that invitation to come to Jesus. And at six years old, I began to feel a mighty tugging power for me to come forward and to give my life to Jesus Christ. I didn't even understand what that really meant. I made my way down to that altar and Pastor Lord looked at me and, and said, do you want to be saved? And all I could do was nod my head. Yes, I couldn't, I couldn't even talk. And so I, everything was brand new the day after that. I mean, I remember it was like daylight and dark the way I felt. And my heart was so amazed at Jesus Christ and I wanted to know him and was serving God as best I knew how to until I was about eight years old and was in Clarendon, Pennsylvania. We'd moved. My dad was working on a steel mill there. And, and in that little congregation where we were, I stood up one Sunday morning and told the congregation that God had called me to preach. I remember everybody applauded and cheered. And I, again, I didn't really know what that meant, but I heard him say that he wanted me to preach one day. And so as time went on and we moved several other places, uh, I began to move away from the Lord. I was always the new kid. and I began to feel like I had something to prove, and I, I really became a compulsive liar. I lied, a, I lied about everything. I, I began to enjoy lying, and I went from one dark place to a darker place to a darker place, and by the time I was 13 years old, I was already drinking for a good while and, and experienced marijuana for the first time, and from that point, it went to chemicals and LSD, other hallucinogens, uh, stronger drink, and I became an everyday alcohol and drug user every day of my life. And I kept going into a darker, darker place. Finally, by the time I was around 20 years old, I had a dream that the devil came to me in a, in a black cape and hood and had burning red eyes and, and talons for fingernails and fangs and I, he was so intimidating that it took my breath and he motioned for me to follow him. Out of fear, I got out of my bed. I was still dreaming and started following him. When I woke up, I had the feeling that I had sold my soul to the devil. And I began to feel like it was hopeless. I began to feel like I was beyond forgiveness. I began to feel like I would never be able to come back, that I'd crossed a point of no return, I began to believe this thing I heard of, of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that I had done that. I began to feel like I'd done that somehow. And, and now I believed I was in a place that God didn't love me anymore. I didn't feel God's presence anymore. I was afraid to bow my head and thank God for the food because I was afraid I wouldn't feel that presence that I used to feel when I was a child. And I thought about suicide quite often, and I guess I would have taken my own life if I hadn't believed that I was going to hell, so I didn't want to hurry up that process. So I, I began to think, well, since I'm going to hell, I might as well live it up. I'm, this is all I get. This is this will be my heaven on earth. This will be all the pleasure I'll have because I'll go into a burning hell. Well, to confirm my feeling, uh, during that same time span, I went to see Black Sabbath at Freedom Hall Civic Center in Johnson City, Tennessee, and the first band that was there 
was Manfred Mann's Earth Band. I don't remember the song that was playing, but I remember for the first time in my life, I wish they would turn that down because the music was so loud it was making me sick, and I was standing right there at the stage. And I was overcome by just a feeling that I was in a furnace. I couldn't breathe, and I asked my friends if they were feeling this heat, and they said, no, it was very comfortable in there. What was wrong with me? I wasn't even high. We couldn't come up with enough pot between us to get high, and I was frustrated because I was at a concert, and I wasn't getting high, so I, I know I wasn't high thinking I was on fire, and it got so hot I passed out and fell to the ground. I remember hitting the floor, and my friends picked me up, and they were shaking me and screaming at me and they seemed like they were a hundred miles away and when one friend was so desperate he was smacking me through the face and it felt like a block of wood I mean I didn't even feel the sting of the slap I was aware that they were trying to wake me up and finally I opened my eyes and they were screaming are you all right we thought you were dead you were cold and I was thinking I'm on fire what are you talking about I couldn't speak and finally I just motioned for them to leave me alone and I said I'm all right and I leaned up against the wall and Within seconds, I had an experience again that I'd had the first time that I will explain now. I was falling down a long cavern that was vertical. Uh, instead of being like a tunnel that was horizontal, it was vertical. And I was going straight down. My hands and feet were chained behind me. There was a gag in my mouth. And the further I fell, the hotter it got. And there were jail cells like stories going down and people were screaming at me, don't come here, go back. And I thought I would if I could. And the further I fell, the hotter it got. And finally I could see a giant ring of fire and I could see hideous creatures dancing in that fire and they were dancing to the music that was playing. I could hear it still in the background. And they were screaming and laughing and jeering and pointing at me. And they were screaming, we have him now. And they had these long talon-like claws and fangs. And, and they were, they could stop your heart. They were so fearful looking. And right when one of them, the tallest one of them, was about to grab me, he reached out to grab me. That's when I came to the first time. When I leaned up against the wall for a few seconds, the second time I had the same exact speed experience just as the first one was again. It happened to me twice. That time they were sure I was dead because I was lifeless. They told me the band that created such a disturbance that the band almost quit playing. People were screaming, you want us to get an ambulance? And so they were telling them not yet. And they, they got under my two of my three friends that were with me got under my arms. And I remember my feet dragging behind me and they pulled me over to the sideline. I remember people cleared out to let me sit down and there were several people standing around to see if they needed to get me some assistance. And I couldn't talk. I couldn't move. It was like I was paralyzed. And so they sat me down. They were holding me up. And it was just like all of a sudden I snapped out of it. And I remember feeling like I was fine. And I started talking to them. And they said, they said what happened? I said, you would believe me if I told you. And so I sat there a few minutes and about that time Black Sabbath was coming on and I got up and they said, where are you going? I said, I'm going back down where I was at. They said, what? I said, yeah, I'm going to see Black Sabbath. That's what I came here for. They said, well, you can go by yourself. We're not going through that again. I said, I'm fine. I said, suit yourself. And so I walked back down there. Next thing I know, here they came because they weren't going <laughs> to leave me to fall into that situation again. I felt fine the rest of the night. I just kind of blew it off. My heart was so hard. Uh, from my years of being backslidden, it, it really didn't occur to me that I had just escaped hell two times. And so the next day when I got up, my godly little mom came to me and said, son, what happened to you last night? I said, well, you know, mom, I told you I went to, to a concert over in Johnson City. She said, that's not what I'm talking about. She said, what happened to you? I said, mom, what do you mean what happened to me? I went to a concert. It was good. We liked it. Of course, I wasn't going to tell her my experience. I said, I don't understand what you mean. She said, son. She said, along about 10 o'clock that night that she was in a sound sleep. My dad was on another job and he was out of town and she was in a sound sleep. And she told me that the Lord had awakened her and told me that, I, that she'd better pray for Tom 
because his soul was in trouble. And she said, son, it was the longest time that I felt like I was trying to pray you out of hell. Well, that rocked my world for a few minutes. And I said, well, mom, I, I don't know what that was about, but I thank you that you care for me that much. And I just kind of blew it and her off and went on about my business. But that was always in the back of my mind that God woke her up. Why would God wake her up and say, pray for me? I began to think about this. If I was too far gone, if there was no forgiveness for me, at that point, I didn't return to the Lord. But it was shortly after that. People were praying for me. They had no idea the life that I was living. But Christian family and friends knew that I wasn't walking with Jesus. And so my sister and mom and grandmother uh, would call on people to pray for Tommy because he needs to come back to where he belongs with Jesus. So while all this is going on, I've fallen deeper. I'm doing, I'm doing LSD all the time, other hallucinogenic drugs all the time. I'm working like that. And uh, on a particular night in that time frame, uh, there was a bomb threat called in to the plant where I worked. It was an internal call. Everyone knew that there was no bomb. They would do this quite frequently after the checks would go around because they would want to go out and party. And so my supervisor came to our line and said, uh, hey, there's been a bomb threat called in again. Of course, we know there's no bomb, but I have to let you know there's been a threat and have to dismiss you if you don't want to stay. You can stay and work. I'm hoping you will, or you can leave. And I looked at my friend who I was carpooling with and said, Junior, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be blown up. <laughs> and he said, me neither. So we took our check, said, thank you kindly. Our supervisor was very upset with us that we would leave and leave him shorthanded to run that line. And so we went to where we uh, parked our cars and we began to smoke marijuana. And uh, we got very, very high. And it was on February 22nd, 1980 at four o'clock. It was on a Saturday morning. And so, uh, we were, that was our, that was our weekend beginning there. And while we were sitting there talking, lightning struck a tree right in front of us, 150 feet at the furthest away, blew the top out of the tree. Branches went everywhere. Some of them hit the car. It was like dynamite went off in the top of that tree. And we jumped back and said, whoa, talk about a light show. Ha, ha, ha. And as I thought about it, I thought, wow. I looked at my friend. I said, Junior, that probably should have been us. He said, what? What are you talking about? I said, well, think about it. It's four o'clock in the morning. You and I are stoned right in God's face. I said, he's sitting on his throne and he's looking at Tom and Junior partying their little hearts out. And I said, it probably should have been us. And he said, oh, man, I wish you wouldn't talk about stuff like this right now. And I said, why? He said, well, I used to be a Christian. I said, you've got to be kidding me. And I laughed. He said, no, no. He said, as a matter of fact, he said, I was dating a girl. She got me going to church. And he said, I got saved. And he said, I know it was real. And I started serving the Lord. And he said, after a few weeks, I had the sense that God wanted me to preach. And it wasn't too long after that that my girlfriend broke up with me. And he said, my friends were calling me preacher and pestering me all the time, trying to get me to get high all the time. He said, I got discouraged. He said, I just turned my back on God and went back to party. And he said, I became worse than I ever was. And he said, you know, honestly, I don't even believe God loves me anymore. I said, Junior, that is ridiculous. I've never heard of anybody say that before? You don't think God loves you? I said, you know, God loves you when nobody loves you. I said, Junior, I know God loves you. As soon as I said that, I heard the voice of God inside of me, uh, like an explosion, say, Tom, I love you too. Come home. And I was, I was so taken aback by that. It was like somebody dumped hot water over my head. I mean, it was just a feeling of warmth came over me and I, I was trying not to cry and I, I couldn't say anything. I couldn't get a word out and he was just sitting there staring at me and finally it seemed like an eternity but after three or four minutes I said, Junior, I said, I've got to go. I said, I don't know what's just happened here. 
But I said, I can tell you one thing. I'm never going to be the same as long as I live. And Junior looked at me and he said, I knew something was happening to you. And I said, I got to go. I got some praying to do. I said, I'll talk to you about it on Monday night. And he said, that's cool. And I got in my car. It was still pouring the rain. And I had started heading toward home. I said, Jesus, is that you? And when I said that, it was like, I felt like he sat down in the seat beside me and put his arm around me. I started wailing. I came unglued. I started confessing everything I could think of and asking forgiveness for every sin. I, as, as itemized as I could be of every kind of sin, I, I finally I just started having to put it in categories because there was so much. It was so overwhelming. And his love and acceptance was so overwhelming. I wept all the way home. I was weeping when I walked through the door. I looked and I saw a Bible that my sister Kathy had given me years prior to that as a little boy for my birthday. And I never really opened it. It was like a brand new Bible. It must have been 10 years old. And I opened it up and started looking. And everywhere I looked, it was like it was talking to me. I'll never forget that. And I got in the bed and I laid there and I read until I went to sleep. And the next thing I knew, and I hadn't slept like that in years because I was so troubled and so guilt-ridden, so empty. My friend Daryl walked through the door at four o'clock that afternoon. I'd slept like a rock all day. I woke up the same peace of God that I went to sleep with was still there. It was a high like I'd never experienced. Daryl had a joint in his hand. He was about to light it. and He would do that every day when he would come in. He worked first, first shift. I worked third. He would light a joint, hand it to me. I'd be stoned when I got out of the bed. I was stoned when I got in the bed every night and stoned when I got up every day. And he looked at me, and I don't know whether he saw a halo or what he saw, but he looked at me with a strange look, and he said, you don't want this, do you? And I was thinking, I don't know what I'm going to say to him. Lord, you're going to have to give me words. He's not going to understand. And I said, Daryl, no, I don't think I want that anymore. He said, he said why? I said, well, at 4 o'clock this morning, I surrendered my life to Jesus and I won't be doing any of this anymore. I'm going to follow him. He said, that's cool. And he walked through the door into the other part of the house. And it was almost like we were strangers after that for a few weeks. I would try to talk to him and I, I didn't realize he was listening, but it just felt like he didn't want to hear it. So I, I just tried to be a better friend than I'd been. In about three months, shortly after Tammy and I were married, Daryl came to Jesus. He married my first cousin, who was a Christian all our life, and Daryl and Laura have been serving God nearly as many years as we have. I just want to say to you that the God I'm talking about is the one and only. In 35 years, he's never done me any way but good. He has done inexplainable miracles over and over through the years and in the lives of my family and, and our church families. He's real. He loves you. You may be feeling like he doesn't care about you, but I can promise you. He loves you beyond your comprehension. He wants you to follow him. If you will, you'll know life, real life. You'll know the God life. You'll know eternal life. You'll know forgiveness. You'll know blessings untold. And God will take your life and shape you and fashion you. Not only bless you, but he will use you to bless many others. And when he uses you, he doesn't abuse us. He privileges us to be a part of what he's doing in the earth. He invites you to come. God changed seven years, transformed seven years of drug and alcohol addiction in my life. And here was the pray prayer I prayed. Jesus, please help me. All those chains fall off, fell off my life at that moment. I've never been the same from that day to this. And I've seen God do very dramatic signs and wonders through the years. Not only in the United States, but on foreign soil. 
He's real. He loves you. If you call on the name of Jesus, he will save you. And that's where it begins. Why don't you surrender your life right now to Jesus Christ? Pick up your cross and follow Jesus Christ every day. Pick up the Bible and call on God's name to help you understand it and live your life by it. And you will have no regrets. You will have nothing but inexplainable joy through time and eternity. God bless you, friend, and I do thank you for watching.